Hey there, Bonneco fans! Welcome back to another episode of Bonneco Rise of Open Armor. In this 2009 episode, we'll be taking a look at Bonneco's newest era. 2009 was going to be totally different than the previous years. Greg Forrest even stated it would bring back a bit of the 2001 year feeling, since we would be exploring a whole new world this time, Baromagna. I bet it'll be a really cool place, probably a beautiful world with vast locations, abundant wildlife species, a whole new set of rules regarding subjects like physics laws, local inhabitants and adventures along the way. Guess I had really high expectations as we rebuild this new place is mainly a desert world. Really? Well, to be fair, when it comes to science fiction, most of the planets are always a single environment theme world, like a whole planet of volcanoes, jungles, ice mountains, or highly technological cities. There's not a planet with a combination of different locations like Earth, or a planet which looks completely different to the point of being truly creative. Now that I think about it, desert planets seem to be quite popular, I mean, we have Dantooine, Barsom, Hobo 13, and Dune, just to name a few. Now we have Baromagna, which in my opinion is bigger than it should be. Here's a map of the Baromagna locations from 2009. There are some outer regions which are not shown, but overall, this is it. And you mean to tell me there's an entire planet of endless sand dunes and rocks for this single civilization? With Aquamagna, the planet in which Metanoi was stranded for a thousand one years, it makes a little more sense because the focus of the story is a giant robot, not the planet itself, and therefore there's no need to explore it. But hey, never judge a book by its cover, let's see what Baromagna has to offer. There are five tribes settling here, Volcanus, the Fire Tribe, Tajun, the Water Tribe, Iconix, the Ice Tribe, Rocks, the Rock Tribe, and Tessara, the Jungle Tribe. So basically, it's like if the island of Mananui had been torn apart into several pieces and then scattered around a certain area. And I find it funny that the promotional images on the website made it look exactly like that. But when I got the chance to see it for myself, I thought it was more like if little specks of Mananui were removed from it and then planted on an infertile soil. Tessara looks like a moss compared to Lekoro, there are no oceans, just a couple of rivers and some oasis, and instead of a majestic volcano like Mangai or Valmai, there's just a stream of lava which flows into volcanoes. But Baromagna wasn't always like this, it used to be a beautiful war a little over a hundred thousand years ago. The great beings arrived at this place which was once called Spheris Magna. They ruled the planet for some time but then assigned direct dominance to have better control over the inhabitants. These were the Element Lords, warriors who were transformed by the great beings into entities made out of elements. Fire, water, ice, rock, jungle and sun. Everything was fine until one day an unknown substance emerged from the core of the planet. The great beings took a sample to study it and discovered that it could transform objects or completely destroy them. The Energized Protodermis. Hungry for power, the Element Lords decided to seize control over it, but they argued with each other about who should claim it. A war, a surge which would be later called the Core War. The Element Lords, with their tribes at their disposal, fought each other for weeks, while the great beings tried their best at stopping it. Failing at every attempt, they conducted a deeper analysis on the energized protodermis and discovered it was destroying the planet little by little. Seeing no way to stop it, they created a giant robot which would leave the planet and study the universe to prevent the same phenomenon from happening elsewhere. Their first prototype didn't work and exploded, having its pieces scattered all over the place as a result. However, they managed to successfully build a second robot using the energized protodermis as a more stable power source, just in time before spheres might have separated into the three planets, which now acted as moons for the larger fragments. This event was called the Shattering, and it was so traumatic for everyone that they forgot completely after several years, thinking that they had always lived in Baromagna. Also, the Sand Tribe went through a regression, a sort of backward evolution, which turned them into savage beasts. The magnificent cities became ruins, forcing the survivors to settle in the small villages, and not to mention, several people died during the events, so if you think about it, it put the Great Cataclysm to shame! So now the blown up pieces of the prototype robot are used as shelters by the inhabitants. Each village has its own resources, but they are rather scarce. Also, the villages are so separated from each other, you need some kind of vehicle to travel for hours in order to visit another one, and on your way there are many dangers like Vorogs, former Sun Tribe members, Batera, Bone Hunters, and Skrull. So if you thought living in Voyanui sucked, you should spend your next vacations on Baromagna and see how long it can last. Now let's talk about the inhabitants. The majority of the population are the Agori, the Matar Ripoffs from Baromagna. They are the workers who keep the villages up and running and are also the leaders of each tribe. The Gatora and their two lookalikes were hired by the villages to protect them and to fight for their resources. Sadly, there are no tribe equivalents, but in exchange for Makuta, we have the Skrull as the bad guys. Not really a whole new world, huh? What does distinguish the Baromite inhabitants from the Matroni Nimbus inhabitants is that these guys are organic and wear metallic armor on top, just like our medieval knights. They have metallic skeletons, however, and they often have implants, which increase physical endurance or agility. Gatorians wear helmets instead of masks, and they have practically no powers. Or so we thought until they were born. 
which made them probably less interesting than the Torah, but honestly, uh, they have some advantages over the biomechanical heroes. Like, for example, since the Torah had no programming, Kran are useless against them. Uh, a Krana could probably infect their, their helmets, but a Makuta wouldn't be able to control them because they don't have the same connection to their helmets that a um, Maturan or Turaga have to their masks. And also, spoilers, Kabura wouldn't be able to uh, block their elemental powers with his tool because that tool was specifically built to uh, block Torah's elemental powers. And just to finish, I'd like to say that Barman inhabitants eat, digest, and reproduce just like we humans do. And I know what you're thinking right now, so stop it at once. After the Cold War, the Agori decided to settle their disputes on a more honorable way. Whenever two villages wanted the same resource, they had to battle each other for it. To do that, they sent their best warriors to the arena, the Gatorian. Each village has two Gatorians. When one of them gets hired, he or she changes the color of his or her armor to match that of the village he or she is working for, and gets paid with a specific supply each village has to offer. Tajun has water, Tessara has food, Roxus has weapons, Iconic has a precious metal called Exidian, and Bucanus has heat, which allows them to create forges in order to repair weapons and armor more easily. Hold on a second. A planet whose disputes between its villages happen on a specific location where the combatants fight against each other on an arena? Where have I seen that before? Now let's look at the scroll. They're related to the Gatoran species, so they share many characteristics with them. Their society is built around classes. The leader class scroll is the strongest one. It commands the rest of the scroll and has the authority to name them if they prove their worth. Then there's the elite special force. They're physically stronger than the rest of the scroll and also more intelligent. Next is the warrior class scroll. They are faster as well as more agile and act as soldiers for the leader class scroll. Last but not least are the sisters of the scroll, the females of the species. They were granted psionic abilities and thus grew to be distrusted and shunned by the males. So they separated from them and formed their own organization. Now let's look at the other plot points that now appear in the movie. So, everyone is getting ready for the great tournament, uh, but before Gresh fights a scroll over an oasis that Tessara found, but loses. Then Gilo fights a bone hunter called Firo and retrieves from him a map containing the defenses of Volcanus. Realizing that was a plan for invasion, Gilo goes to tell Randu and they manage to recruit Gatorns to defend the village, which they, which they just barely did. Then the mask of light rides in the bar by the desert and manually is reborn. The events of the movie take place and afterwards, Manami follows the map that is found on the coin that Beris gave him and on the scroll shields, which leads him to the Valley of the Maze. Uh, he passes many tests inside and many traps, but eventually gets to the center of the maze. As for novels, we only have one, Red of Volcanus, which tells the story of the bone hunters invading the village of fire. It also explores a bit more of this stranger who is giving away information to all of the scroll about the tribes of Agori. Uh, as for serials, we have Empire of the Skrull, which tells the story of the, of the species of the Skrull and also uh, shows us the traitor making a deal with Tuma in exchange for his services. We also have Riddle of the Great Beings, which tells the story of Tarduk and uh, Gordy from Tsara, who goes on a mission after finding an ancient scroll that said the words Red Star. He goes with some friends to find the Great Beings, and in his way, he meets a presumably dead Gatoran called Sural, and also the Element Lords, who are still alive and in Bar Magna. Now, I'd like to take this opportunity to talk deeply about the Great Spirit Robot, since I couldn't say it on a 2008 review. Basically, every island in the Matron universe is inside the robot. The islands are separated into sections called domes, which are parts from the robot. For example, the mainland is just one single dome. The sky above the islands is of course false, and it is also part of the robot's armor. Imagine a sandwich. The breath is the metal parts of the robot, and the center is the islands. To better explain the whole subject of the Greek cataclysm and robot, I'm going to share with you Greg Farsi's classical egg analogy. You have egg A and egg B. Egg A, the mainland, surrounds the universe core, which is the joke, and is inside egg B. Part of egg A, let's say Voyanui, breaks off, leaving a hole in egg A, and breaks a hole in the shell of egg B. Water from outside comes down through the egg B hole and into egg A, and so into the core. The entire interior of the egg A is not filled with water because it is vast, and when Voyanui returns to where it is supposed to go, the hole in egg A is sealed. As for how the hole in egg B gets sealed, that was repaired by the staff of Artakham. For Matsunui and Matanui, I'll go back to my sandwich example. The bread is still the robot's armor and the center is Matsunui. Then, if I spread some jam on top of the bread, that is the island of Matanui. 
The Great Spirit Robot has total knowledge of the beings living inside him, and pretty much can do whatever it wants with the islands and inhabitants inside him, like controlling gravity and temperature, being able to teleport beings and destroy islands at will, or open the ground beneath someone, all sorts of things. It can fly, but in order to leave a planet, it needs the Red Star, which sticks to its back, adding a boost for takeoff. Now I want to point out the fact that the Great Beings had all kinds of backup plans at their disposal in case Manenu experimented problems while being on his mission. I can imagine the Great Beings being like... What is going to happen to Sima Tenui? That's what will put two pilots inside of Manenu's head so they can take over the controls when necessary. It was like they're dead. Well then just put Charlie Fong in charge. Can? He's used to his island. Well then, uh, as long as the tall might get back to Mitch Moon then they can still save everyone. It looks like the cannons does not function and they're just floating in the ocean. Well then, I look at the motor and keep on working and everything will be fine. <laughs> Looks like they moved to the island and both went over to his face. You know what? I don't care anymore. I simply don't. Just let the Kanoki Nick initiate its count and then kill everyone inside. I'm out of here. <laughs> Maranui was sent to study the universe in order to prevent any other problems like it had happened in Spheres Magna. I think I recall reading that whenever he reached a planet, he would turn intangible or something in order to hide beneath the ground and then his face would enable the camouflage system creating the Maranui Island so that the planet's natives wouldn't notice his presence. Maranui spent thousands of years traveling across space. He was almost finished and on his way to Barra Magna when suddenly Makura struck him with a virus and made Maranui crash in Aqua Magna, ironically close from his goal. This year says how thornets launchers. Thornets are fruits which grow in the Barabangan Desert. When ripe, they become hard as rock and that's why they are used as ammunition for the arena matches. When overripe, they become explosive. And when unripe, they are used as an ingredient for a stew uh, which smells and tastes as horrible. That's why it's all eaten by the ball hunters and the sand tribe members. Overall, this year felt like a completely new beginning for Banco. Like we were going through a new direction and we were really eager to know why was that direction. Uh, because, you know, Maranui still had to confront Makuda, but at the time, it felt like we, it would still take him like two more years, because he still had to find a new power source for the portal robot, and we still had to visit Boa Magnus, so we were really anxious, because we felt like there were going to be so many new adventures to have in the upcoming years, we were really anxious, and we could do nothing but to wonder what was going to happen. We could do nothing but just have all our story, all our story fan fictions and all our new theories on the internet and all that. So it was really magical, man. I mean, it really br brought back a bit of the 2001 feeling of mystery, and that's what Bionicle always made, made so good. Mystery, that was the key of Bionicle always. So this year was really good, and we were really anxious as to what was going to happen next. In fact, I'm really anxious to see what 2010 is going to bring. I can't wait. In fact, I'm going to see you in the next half an hour before I die of anxiety. So, uh, until next time, take care. Whoa, man, what's going to happen?